Now, I don't want to scare you unnecessarily, but there is a killer bug out there. The problem is we don't know what it is, where it is, and when it will hit us. The next pandemic, are we ready? You're watching Roundtable with me, David Foster. So just who is working on spotting it, keeping it contained when it comes and stopping it from spreading around the world. They're spreading at alarming rates and catching global health systems off guard. Old diseases are making a comeback and new threats are emerging. It's left health authorities with a warning. The world may be unprepared for the next pandemic. A new virus is testing Nigeria's health system. Lassa fever, which spreads after contact with infected rat urine, has killed 110 people so far this year. Cases of measles, a disease all but eliminated in the United Kingdom as of 2016, have quadrupled in Europe as vaccination rates fall across the continent. The 2013 West African Ebola crisis claimed more than 11,000 lives. Contracted through contact with infected blood and other bodily fluids, Ebola spread quickly because of how dead bodies are handled in West African tradition. And limited infrastructure can find people to towns and villages suffering from outbreaks. In an era of international travel, a deadly virus can be carried over thousands of miles in a matter of hours to packed cities where epidemics spread like wildfire. Rapid environmental change wreaked by human activity has brought animals into closer contact with people, accelerating the spillover of animal pathogens into human populations. The cost of a global pandemic can be as great as 3.5 trillion US dollars. The 2003 SARS outbreak saw fewer than 800 deaths, but cost the global economy $54 billion in lost trade, transportation disruption, and healthcare costs. We must re reverse the trend in global health, where we wait for the fire to flare up, run to put it out, but then forget to fireproof the building. Ambitious projects that detect and respond to emerging pathogens can help contain outbreaks, but cuts to aid for science research have cast doubt over their sustainability and some governments remain reluctant to invest in things now that might save lives later. We don't know what will happen, but it's a high enough chance uh, that one of the lessons of Ebola should be to ask ourselves, are we as ready for that as we should be? Economists say the cost of preventing an epidemic would be a fraction of the cost of battling a global pandemic. Is it time for governments to rethink global health policy before it's too late? Well, I'm very pleased to say that joining us on Skype is the Medical Director of Partners in Health, Sierra Leone, Dr. Marta Lado. Right now, she's in the capital of the Gambia, Banjul, from Nottingham. We have Jonathan Ball, a virologist at Nottingham University. And with me at the round table, we have Emma Diggle, who's a vaccination and epidemic advisor for Save the Children, and Michelle Khan, who's an assistant professor at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Thank you all very much uh, for joining us on round table. Let me ask you, first of all, um, with SARS, which didn't spread, with Ebola, which didn't really spread. Did that prove we've got it right and we don't really have to worry? No, I would argue it, it didn't. And um, while you said it, we don't want to create alarm, but there is a lot that needs to be done. As you mentioned, because we don't know what the particular disease is going to be, where it's going to come from, we really need to strengthen systems that are broad and can, and can mitigate any potential risks. But it, Ebola didn't spread worldwide. Neither did SARS. Zika didn't, which was in Brazil, and a few cases popped up here, here and there. So, but I know more can always be done, but should we worry that um, 
there is one out there that is actually going to take over the world and decimate populations. Yeah, it's a it is a valid point in terms of balancing the, the emphasis on these emerging infectious diseases versus diseases that are already killing people. There's certainly in developing countries concern that uh, policymakers over there have to make arguments for potential threats when there's actual threats and diseases such as tuberculosis, diarrheal disease that are already killing people. So it is a, it is a challenging Well, th this is where we go to Marta. I mean, you're in Gambia at the moment taking a bit of a break, but uh, Sierra Leone was, was badly hit uh, during Ebola. And um, I'm mm. wondering if it's, if, if, if it's felt in that country that there is no preparedness if something big comes along. So definitely we are more ready now to anything that happens than what we were like four years ago. But we need to consider that most of the resources that we have in the West and in developed countries are very weak in this location. So it, the capacity of response is definitely minimal compared to what happens in Europe or US or other developed countries. So we will never feel safe enough. And isn't that part of the problem? The it, problem it isn't is until, sorry for jumping in, um, it isn't until the disease spreads to places where, you know, righteous middle class white people go, gosh, this is coming near me, that anybody pays any particular attention. Exactly. And, and that's what happened during the Ebola outbreak. Nobody paid too much attention, at least in international organizations, until it started affected the West. Mm. Jonathan and Emma, I'm going to ask you the same question, but in a slightly different um, way. Uh, Jonathan, from your point of view, you, you study these beasts, these nasty, tiny things that we, we, we can't really see and most of us don't understand until, until we fall ill. Are we prepared? Uh, we're not at all prepared. And I think the, the main issue has already been alluded to is the fact that health care infrastructures in most parts of the developing world are poorly resourced. They aren't effective enough to be able to consistently and continually monitor for the emergence of infectious diseases as and when they occur. So if we do look back to uh, e Ebola virus, and, and bearing in mind that that part of West Africa had not seen Ebola virus before, so it wasn't expecting it. But the reality was that the virus emerged probably in December in 2013. It wasn't until March 2014 that the WHO were alerted to the fact and, and identified that there was an Ebola outbreak. And it wasn't until May that the first cases had been identified in Sierra Leone. Like for all of those weeks and months, the virus had been circulating in those uh, countries in Guinea and, and Sierra Leone in particular. And it's because of the fact that it wasn't spotted, it meant that it could get to uh, large cities where it could spread uh, quite widely. Mm. And of course, we live in a joined up world and so it could spread uh, around that part of West Africa. I'll, I'll ask you about um, investigation and research in just a moment, but Emma, the same question to you. As an organisation, your job is to go in and protect young people, save the children. Are, are you, as an organisation, do you feel comfortable that you are prepared for the next one, if and when it comes? Well, when it comes. Um, I, I mean, we're making a very strong effort to be as prepared as possible, but it's not just about us, it's about um, collective engagement. And while we may be prepared, there might be other countries or other organisations who are not in line um, with us. So we, we all have to work together to be so prepared. So is part of your job making sure that the, the chain, if you like, is complete? A part of it, and, um, and also engaging in other chains. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and in terms of in conflict zones, which is where you seem to do most of your work um, mm -hmm. personally, but I mean, there's also sort of areas of West Africa where I know that this, this is um, taken very seriously by your organisation. Mm -hmm. Do you feel um, that the, the joined up thinking is there and that people will be ready? Because with Ebola, it took a long time for people to work out what to do. Mm -hmm. Um, I would say the joined up thinking is there in some places, but not in others. And I mean, I'm, and that's going to impact us when the time comes. There are some countries who are engaging in, um, in very recently formed task forces, which are, have been set up to. Oh well, help us, help us with that because I mean that would be quite interesting if other people could study them and take a look and see what they were doing. Where, where in particular? 
Um, when, for example, there's a, there's a global cholera task force which has been set up to tackle cholera and reduce the morbidity of cholera by 90% by 2030. Um, and many people are engaging, but not everyone. And, and it's going to be hard to tackle cholera if we don't all engage. What, what, what is the next thing? We'll talk yeah. about cholera because you wanted to jump in. Anybody jump in at any time, that's fine. So I was just saying, uh, to follow up, I think it's a question about who should be taking ownership and who's mm. responsible. And as you're saying, it's, it's everybody's responsibility and therefore con affected countries themselves have to, have to play a large role in determining the priorities, in perhaps providing financing and, and that's, that's been a challenge because there's so many competing issues that they have to and deal with. And this is the difficulty, isn't it? it? It isn't cheap to do this. You do need money. Um, and if you're going to spend that money in your, an impoverished country anyway, it's going to be quite difficult to justify for something that hasn't happened yet. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it is a difficult case to make. So, so is it a matter for the West, if you want, I, I sometimes hate the phrase, but I mean, I think we all know what I mean by that, richer countries, let's put it that way, uh, to, matter to take, on, take on some of the responsibility? Yeah, that's exactly the point. Like, we are not isolated anymore. So what happens in other parts of the world, even if you don't want to accept it, is going to end up affecting you. So we need to all take responsibility of it. It's not only West Africa problem. Right now, with the capacity of the communication, of movement of people and migration of birds, animals, and climate change and everything, right now, it, all the all the transmission can be so easy that it's not isolated in West Africa or in other region that is low resources setting. And, and is that what you mean when you say that there is a, a, a lack of health surveillance on a large scale, that people aren't talking to the people they need to talk to and getting, getting some kind of international action plan? Yes. And also, it's the idea of a involving everyone in the same problem all together like we are all responsible for all the parts of the system it's not only my country is protected we have a preparedness plan what happens with other areas that end up affecting you because of all this communication and movement yeah yeah did you jump in there because then i'm going to go to jonathan yeah okay no i mean and countries have to um feel okay to speak out. If they, mm. if they have a, a disease, they need to declare it. And some countries don't because um, they are worried that it might affect business or tourism. And um, we need to somehow incentivize yeah, them really to feel confident. Well, Marta's nodding in agreement yeah, with that. Really I mean, I, that, that really does surprise yeah. me. So they're not notifiable in mm. certain countries. Well, or or even are they if notifiable and Even if the they global don't. community is encouraging countries to report early, it's important to bear in mind that if there's financial consequences, if flights are going to stop, tourism is going to drop, for example, after Zika. Mm. These countries then face a lot of deaths and uh, human resource crisis, as well as financial impacts that are broader. So I think it's unrealistic for us, if you want to call it, in richer countries, to just assume that these countries will, will have to do it without any kind of compensation or incentive. OK, so perhaps we should give them some financial assistance for declaring it, because that is going to hurt them financially. Yes. Well, that's an interesting point. Um, Jonathan, with the mechanics of this, um, and you are a virologist, you study the way things mutate and, and you take a look at sort of what the possible next cause are, a variety of questions here. Um, are there diseases out there that we should be particularly worried about? I mean, I've, I've read about monkeypox. And are there, are there diseases that we think we've sort of dealt with that are just still under the surface and are being contained rather than eliminated? This is one of the biggest uh, challenges that we have, is to, to try and preempt what the next outbreak will be. And of course, researchers and, and the scientific community try and do that based on existing knowledge. But um, there are lots of uh, unknown unknowns out there, as it were. And uh, we, we don't know for sure where the next viral threat will come from. And some very learned colleagues of mine are very worried about monkeypox, for example, because as uh, time goes on, more and more people who've been vaccinated against smallpox, and we think the smallpox vaccine is giving protection against monkeypox, as that immunity wanes from the people around the world, then it could be that this virus emerges. But I think the reality is it could be any one of many infectious virus threats. And, and the real key here is being able to pick them up quickly enough, because unfortunately or fortunately, whichever way you look at it, 
we live in an incredibly connected world. Uh, we are a, a, a global uh, uh, entity and, and therefore these things, these viruses can move very rapidly at, at distances and speeds that were just unheard of uh, half a century because ago. Because we are globally connected. Let, let me ask you a question regarding monkeypox and smallpox. I mean, smallpox, as we understand it, has been eradicated, apart from the story I read about sort of under the tundra, uh, perhaps in, in northern Siberia. Um, is it the fact that a generation has grown up now without necessarily the need for immunisation uh, that makes them susceptible to monkeypox because there hasn't been smallpox that's needed to be vaccinated against? Yeah, we, we have eradicated smallpox. There are only two virus uh, diseases that we've eradicated. Uh, one is called rinderpest, which infects livestock. The other is smallpox. And it was an in incredibly effective uh, vaccination campaign that brought about the eradication of smallpox. And we're trying to do the same, for example, with polio virus. And, and this, this harks back to the comment about um, conflict zones. One of the biggest threats to the polio eradication program is conflict in places like Afghanistan, Pakistan, uh, and also in parts of Africa, because always conflict ca can hinder not only surveillance, but also any interventions that, that we might uh, develop. Mark, I'll come to you in just a minute, but Emma, you were nodding there because conflict zones is your area of expertise. Yes, and where um, I mean, there are recent examples in Yemen and Bangladesh where diphtheria has um, there's yeah. been an outbreak of diphtheria, and that's because vaccination coverage is so low, and health staffs. Uh, so, so in your job is to look after vaccinations. Hmm. How possible would it be without the fighting? In other words, if something stopped the conflict for a period of time to get in there and try and prevent this from spreading. It's, it's, when I say this, I mean whatever it happens to be. It's possible, but it's, it takes an enormous amount of resources and focus, but we, we can do it, and, and that's very much part of our role. And um, we have a vaccination campaigns continuing in Syria and Yemen, but it's, it's hard work. <laughs> yeah. Can I just jump in here? Yeah, please, please, the anytime. example of um, sort of polio in, in Pakistan. Pakistan is a country that I work a lot in, and so conflict is one of the issues, but some of the... Uh, sort of softer side that's often neglected is trust. Um, so there's parts of Pakistan where uh, vaccination is an, is, is an issue even without conflict it's because you can't tribal areas. Tri or even in parts of Karachi, yeah. which is a city, and and it's not uh, these vaccine issues also in developed countries. You see there's increasing concerns about healthcare providers and parents being concerned about vaccination. So so it, it really does require involvement of local communities and organizations as well in addition to the resources yeah there, there might, might be people watching this sort of pulling at their collar thinking i don't feel particularly well just because of what we're talking about can anybody give them some good news so the good news uh, at I, least from from my point of view working and living in sierra leone is that we have been able to learn lessons from the last outbreak the healthcare system is improving the awareness of a given importance to outbreaks and, and surveillance of diseases is something that right now is like a very prevalent thing. So definitely we have learned from the last outbreak to be able to detect and identify a threats earlier than what we were like four or five years ago in areas like West Africa, Sierra Leone. Okay, and Jonathan, you were gonna say something? Well, I was just picking up on, on the issue of trust. So, so for example, you know, trust is a, is a huge problem in trying to control outbreaks of infectious diseases because, you know, we yeah. often go in and, and you use the, the, the phrase the West. Well, the Western world often goes into these places without full appreciation of various cultures and beliefs and, and the way that people uh, behave. And it's very difficult in the first instances to kind of impose upon these communities what we think is a way of dealing with these um, infection outbreaks. So it is a, a lot of work. It's not just scientific, it's a lot of sociology that's required to, to bring about uh, these changes. And, and picking up on the issue of, of trust in particular, uh, we, we know that you know there are things that have happened in the past. So for example, with the polio eradication program, there was a, a big problem because the CIA had infiltrated the vaccination yeah. program to try and obtain DNA swabs and samples when they were trying to track down Osama bin Laden. And, and this caused a, a real backward step in, in progress in the fight against polio in, in the Afghanistan and Pakistan areas. Yeah, absolutely agree.
absolutely agree. OK, um, so what about, um, we, there's an issue at the moment with uh, trust with just NGOs in particular and some charity workers as well, so that's, that's another issue. But let me ask you whether NGOs have the responsibility to go in there, effectively to clean up, to advise, um, on a smallish scale, or whether those major corporations, which happen to be there anyway, international corporations, have a duty, a responsibility to put money into helping with the health systems in these countries? Is that happening? Yeah, well, I think um, it's, with companies, it's often it's more useful to think about what works in their interests rather than thinking about responsibilities. But and a it lot could, of could be mutually. Yes, beneficial. exactly. So I think that's <laughs> that's something that we should look for. Um, for example, extractives industries, airlines. These industries would be their profits would be affected by outbreaks, so it, they would potentially be good partners to get on board. And the other important thing to remember with these some of these companies is that they have long-term investment in these countries. They're there for 25, 30 years, whereas NGOs often have to rely on short-term funding. So if they're there for the long term, they can make and, a meaningful. And, and is this happening at all, Emma? Do you have any experience of that? Like sort of big international companies. You mentioned airlines. You talk about mining corporations, etc., yeah. etc. Et are they prepared to sort of help in this way? Um, I, I haven't had much experience with that, but I have heard about it, and I, I think, um, I mean, there's this issue of corporate social responsibility, and, and it, uh, I have heard um, it being mentioned. Okay. So, so what, what else are you hearing about where the next big outbreak is likely to be? Where, where's your antennae raised the most? Um, I, I don't think you can predict where the next big outbreak mm. is going to be, but I I do think that um, we need to be prepared in every way possible. Um, we are, it's not just about vaccinations, it's about um, a multi-sectoral approach. We need to train communities, we need to um, train people at all levels of... Um, and is that happening? It's happening to a certain degree, but a lot more work needs to go into it and a lot more funding. OK, Sierra Leone, uh, Marta, I mean, is, is that happening? You talk about how things are better than they were. How much further do they need to go? Well, definitely, there's a, it's not a perfect system, and we have a still a long way to go. The problem with um, NGOs and donors and international organizations is that uh, we have to be careful about, like, duplicating mm. systems is never a good idea. Michelle, you, you were agreeing with the yeah, sentiment. Yeah, duplication. Yeah, so duplication should definitely be avoided. And just going back to the point also about not ha imposing things uh, completely from external parties without understanding local norms and working potentially with... Uh, local leaders. So I can give you a very specific example around Ebola and a washing of, of sort of dead bodies before burial. And that's often, you know, a lot of communities do that. And then when healthcare providers are encouraging that, that not to be done, it, it does create issues. And But if a local leader or a local religious leader gave the same message, it might be received more readily. So those are things that we we should think about. John, John, oh, sorry. Do, no, well, no, no, I, I agree with you, but I do think we need globally driven initiatives as well to get the funding in. Um, For funding? Yeah, so we need a bit of both. Uh, Jonathan, uh, um, I, I know you haven't got a crystal ball, but um, where would, should we expect the knockout punch to come from? Where, where are you concentrating any efforts <laughs> you, you have? Well, yeah, we, we, we have a, a mixed portfolio, if that's the right, the right term, for the sort of viruses that, that we're interested in. They can all be classified as emerging, but the reality is that they're all viruses that we know about. We're also doing some uh, virus discovery programs to try and work out what viruses are out in animals and, and various reservoirs, potential reservoirs. But, but the truth is we, we can't predict. So, so you mentioned SARS at the top of the program. Now, this is a, a virus which is, uh, belongs to a family called coronaviruses. We always thought of these as fairly inane, harmless viruses that caused um, upper respiratory tracts, so colds in, in humans. And then along comes this uh, virus that emerged out of bats. It passed into a, an animal called a civet cat in the West Markets. And, and then we had an outbreak which, which which we can class as a pandemic because it certainly crossed uh, the world and, and ended up in Canada. So we can never predict when, where the next uh, threat's come in from. But if you were that worried about it, you'd never go out of your house. It's just something we have to live with, really, isn't it? Yeah, it, and some of the system, yeah, some of yeah. the systemic factors that I've sort of come across in my work, for instance, the increasing intensive agriculture, mixing of human and animal populations, that's a broad driver that's causing 
some infectious diseases, um, viruses, bacteria to, to move between animals and humans. There's that element. There's conflict, which has been mentioned, which is fortunately putting large populations living mm. in, in conditions that, that's taking us back, as we say, to the Dark Ages. So okay, th those people who are responsible for this full time, and I'm talking about the World Health Organization on the one hand, uh, CDC, let's say, Center for Disease, Disease Control in, in Atlanta, and other international bodies, are they failing us? Well, I think the WHO, for instance, have engaged on useful initiatives. Um, there's the joint external evaluations, which have been conducted in many countries to look at the status of preparedness. So steps are being taken. I, I, I think it would be harsh to say that, that they're failing us, but it's not it's just one of those things. Listen, I'm sorry we have to end it here. Thank you very much, all of you, for taking part in this uh, round table. Depressing subjects, and goodness knows how you managed to go to work and keep a smile on your face. Uh, but we appreciate everything that you're doing to make sure that we all stay fit and healthy if we can. And thank you for watching this edition of Roundtable from me, David Foster, and the rest of the team. Goodbye for now. We hope to have your company next time.